What's up, everybody? TJ here. Real quick before we get started with the episode, I'm testing out a new feature called Fan Mail, which is where you can actually text me from the episode that you're listening to. So as you're listening to this, go over to the episode description and right there at the beginning, you're going to see some text that says, send me a text message. Go ahead, click that. Let me know what you think about the podcast so far. Let me know of any questions, concerns, anything you might have. I love to hear from you. So go ahead, hit that up. I'm excited to read your text and let's get started with the episode. Ultimately, it's such a huge step and important thing for the federal government to say this isn't the same thing as heroin. Let's move it down. Let's put it into a, a different schedule. But unfortunately, it is still in that area where it's not over the counter. It's in the same schedule as ketamine and steroids, which probably means that fire service in general ain't exactly going to be changing policy to let people do this stuff anytime soon. Welcome to the Keep the Promise podcast, where we help build resilient and well-rounded firefighters. About what, like two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, word came down that the DEA was rescheduling marijuana from a Schedule 1, which includes the big names like heroin, quaaludes, and so on and so forth, to a Schedule 3 drug, which sent these cheers of joy throughout the whole fire service community, because all of us who have been advocating for that green medicine immediately thought, hell yeah, you know, take out a rolling paper, start, start rolling up that joint, and then I was like, wait a second. When it comes to any sort of substance dealing with the fire service, nothing is ever going to be simple because we like to hyper complicate things. And that's when I reached out to you to try to understand what the ramifications are. And we had a quick conversation, which opened my eyes to the fact that there is going to be a lot of work still to be done, but that the effects, the ripples, go well beyond our ability to partake in this and still be safe for the job, which is something that we advocate. For those of you just joining us, this is my buddy John from Rescue on CBD. He was a guest in episode 21 where we talked about being a resilient firefighter and how CBD can help us in our path to healing and growth and to become better firefighters without becoming addicted to opioids and ending up, you know, doing immoral things on a street corner for some heroin. And as the smart man that he is and the driven businessman and the good fireman that he is, he knows his shit. So today we are going to pick his brain about as many things as we can dealing with this rescheduling of marijuana from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 3, and how hopefully they're going to benefit us in the fire service. John, thank you so much for joining me. I'm, as always, pumped to talk with you. Why don't you give us a quick intro of who you are, what you do, and how you ended up becoming basically the drug expert. I'm the Colombian, and somehow you are the drug expert. Uh, some things in life just aren't fair. Um, thanks, man. I, I I love coming on here. And and um, the first time we, we spoke... Uh, that was the most popular post and podcast episode and thing that we had on, on Rusty One. And, and so, uh, I always appreciate it. Um, yeah, the, the time that I've been running Rusty One, I've, I've seen a, a pretty significant change in the fire service, in the acceptance of CBD, um, hemp research. And now with marijuana, um, you know, we always had like the Pittsburgh local one thing where they had marijuana for a while. Then FDNY, Chicago Fire started jumping on. But this is something different. It's at a federal level. And when you and I spoke about it originally, you know, I know we went back and forth. Um, it's uh, it's really, I, I'll say this, to sum the whole thing up right up front, it's really, really interesting. I also, at the same time, I don't think it's that as big of a deal as some people think, you know? Taking Sorry. away that on my sales from the get-go, huh? Okay. What? Let's go back. What do you do? What makes you this? How, why do I see you I as an authority know. in why this do you? field? So, um, 
I, uh, I, when I, I started rescue one, um, four years ago. And since then I've, I've even before that I, I was diving deep into the CBD industry when I, when I worked for another CBD company and then started one, not for firefighters. And that had THC in it, full spectrum CBD with THC in it. And, uh, I started learning how things were made. Um, I got super interested in production and manufacturing and totally nerding out on lab stuff without any background in chemistry. I just really, really, really was interested by it. So I started speaking to people and understanding how these things worked. Um, and I got very infatuated with the idea of coming up with a zero THC CBD product for firefighters. Well, that can only be done with a shit ton of oversight, uh, meticulous lab work, and done by people with a lot of letters after their name that I don't have. So I had to kind of talk with people um, and work with people who are much, much, much smarter than me and pick their brain constantly um, all the way up to trying to speak to researchers um, at places like Johns Hopkins Cannabis Science Lab, the University of Maryland, um, Arcadia University in Philly. I've talked to and and currently I'm working with with research, uh, some of those prominent forensic scientists as far as urinalysis and, and uh, cannabinoids in, in the country, arguably the world. Um, this doesn't make me an expert, but I do try to stay on top of my shit. And I'm constantly um, reading about research and trying to put it into practice. So Rescue One is actually, without giving anything away, in the middle of, of a really big research study that's going to be through the University of Maryland and the University of Arcadia. So we're like actively participating in this stuff. Cannabinoids aren't as understood as they should be, and we're trying our best to um, make it that way, especially for the fire service. So when this stuff came out, you know, you and I had spoke because you're like, all right, so we rolling this thing up or what's happening? Like, does this, does this pave the way? Is this the is this the yellow brick road for us or is, you know, what, what's the deal? Um, so I think that's why, uh, it, it, it should be talked about on this podcast because even like me keeping my finger on the pulse constantly, literally reading about it every single day, seven days a week for years now, I still don't even know hundred percent what it's going to mean, which probably means that fire service in general ain't exactly going to be changing policy to let people do this stuff anytime soon, but we can go into exactly why that is. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the gist of it. That's one of the things that I really admire about you. You're talking about keeping your finger on the pulse and doing your ridiculous amount of research, which I can personally attest yeah. to because I've seen you, I've seen you do that work, but as a good fireman, you're able to bring it back to our world, to a way that's understood. And I think that's been, that that's one of the reasons that, that I feel Rescue One is the leader when it comes to this stuff in the fire service, because you have that perspective. You have that ability to bring it down to the rank and file. This is what it means from what I see with the understanding that a lot of shit might still be up in the air, but hey, this is the science behind it. This is how I do things. Ultimately, what does it mean? You're not going to pop when you use our products. And I feel that's how you've built that authority. And so, you know, yeah, I'm hyping you up and, you know, kind of, kind of weird, but I guess I got to pay you for all those. <laughs> I appreciate when it. I was yeah. down there. But, uh, it's, um, no better person to talk about this than you, because you'll get to a point that you'll say, I don't fucking know what this means. And if we get there, then, then we get there. But we have a couple of notes, things that we're going to cover. Shall we start with the three phases for pharmaceuticals? I think that's what involves the the study that he said we're going to, you know, put like 200 people in yeah, a row and see what happens. Yeah, that's basically how right? I described it. Well, you know, the we, we have to go back and talk about what making it Schedule 3 does for pharma first. So before a drug can become a drug, you know, in a pharmaceutical company, it has to be um, scheduled so that it has medicinal use. For example, ketamine is schedule three. Now it's in there with marijuana. So ketamine is in the same thing as, as marijuana. It has medicinal use. It can be prescribed. Um, that doesn't mean that 
it is a actual prescription. Like acetaminophen is a drug. It doesn't actually become um, prescribed or a drug or over the counter or whatever until, you know, Pfizer made it or whoever the hell makes it, made it into a drug. To do that, you have to have trials. You got to try this shit out and make sure that, first of all, it's um, not going to kill anybody. Then second of all, how it works in the human body. And then the third trial, the third phase of that that uh, trial is human studies. Does it work for the one specific thing that you're saying it works for? Those are three phases that ha- you have to go through for the FDA to, to have it approved. When it says FDA approved medication, that's what you have to go through. And you have to prove it each way. And it costs millions of dollars and takes years to do. Um, so uh, like the really, really popular um, drug Ozempic or Wagovi, that was a one, it was, it was pretty crazy, but the, the third phase, the clinical trial was one year. Um, it was like 1,900 people. And it was done, I think in 2018 or something like that. And it's 2024 right now. Um, I'm sorry, it's like 2022, 2024 right now. So, but before that, I mean, they started researching that stuff years before. It just takes time for it to go through those phases, to prove that it's safe, to understand how it works in the body and get it out there. So like they can't, like the, the reference I made was like, you know, using it for marijuana, it being schedule one, it's up there with heroin. It would be like them saying, we're going to inject a bunch of heroin into people and see how it works in the human body. And uh, like prove the safety profile, you know, this isn't that this is, you know, why would you put marijuana in the same schedule as that? So it's, I think ultimately it's such a huge step and important for important thing for the federal government to say, this isn't the same thing as marijuana. Let's move it down. Let's put it into a, a different schedule. But unfortunately it is still in that area where it's not over the counter. It's in the same thing as ketamine, the same schedule as ketamine and steroids. Um, which is a weird category to be in. Cause you're like, where, like, those are very, you know, for those of you that have used marijuana, I, people don't believe me. And I'll still say this, even though people don't believe me, I've never used THC products at all. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say like, yeah, <laughs> prude, prude, uh, they'll still say it did very, very different effects between, you know, what marijuana is and the things in that category. So, um, could, could a drug company make it a prescription medication? It's possible. Um, that's that's a conversation that we could have, but uh, it's I have my thoughts and feelings on that. So what I'm gathering from this is that while, yes, it is a victory in that we were able to take away a little bit of that stigma almost, being able to finally say like time out this is not going to turn you into a fiend you're not going to be like i said doing hate committing heinous crimes so you can get your next fix where that schedule three it still needs to be prescribed and we still have a ton of research to do before i can walk over to cvs and be like hey yeah. give me my little marijuana yeah, that's pill. basically it um because at what what a good way to think about it is if you make it schedule three, you're depending on a pharmaceutical company to undertake to shoulder the burden of the research to fund it and to hopefully get it approved by insurance companies for the thing that they're asking you to. When I say thing, I'm, I'm talking about an indication. So if they were to pharmaceutical company can apply to the FDA to say, I want to use this for pain. And then you get then I would go, OK, well, three phases. First, first of all prove that it's safe. Second of all, I'm sorry. First of all, prove that it's safe. Second of all, prove that it, how it works in the body. And third, show me that THC works better than a placebo. And that'll, then they'll, they'll let them make it a medication, but still has to get improved by insurance. Do you think anybody in big pharma is going to take that leap? I can only imagine the size of the, like the chunk of business out there for it. Like that is a slice of pie for the taking that if I were a big pharma having billions and billions, I would want to try to snatch that up well, before somebody else uh, does. Again, I'm an amateur. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a pharmacist. And I'm I'm somewhat of a businessman. But I'm small pharma. Small Thank pharma. you. I'm not big pharma. I'm small pharma. Um, that's really fucking funny. We should. I'm going to make sure 
Dude, I'm making sure this is a small pharma. A small Damn pharma. it, TJ. Um, so yes, <laughs> rescue Hell one yeah. CBD, small pharma. So uh, no, here's here's what I think. Um, if you're gonna do that, you have to solve a problem. So they're gonna either fill a void that's not being addressed right now, or they're gonna take business away from another another drug. Could they take business away uh, from fentanyl? I don't know, but that's what, that's where the incentive would have to be. They have to make their money back and they're going to spend an, a not insignificant amount of money. They're going to spend millions on, on research. How are they going to make it back? Well, they either have to, they have to find a niche that's going to be buying it. So are they going to do, are they going to fill a void either? Maybe it's not pain. Maybe it's anxiety. They could, you know, might be more successful going after anxiety, which THC has a it's arguable whether it helps anxiety in a lot of people. Um, but it, the point I'm getting at is like, either you're going to fill a void or you're going to take business away from, from, from someone else. Like you're going to do it better. And if you're going to do that, it has to be approved by insurance. If it's going to be improved by insurance, I don't even know if insurance would approve it, man. Like, you know, they're going to say, how much do you want? How much, and this is what they're, this is what I think they're thinking. An insurance company is going to ask Pfizer, they're going to go, okay, you have this pill, um, you know, we'll call it Mary Jane. It's called Mary Jane now. And it's, it's Delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol. It's just THC. Uh, so Mary Jane, you're going to, you're going to charge people how much, how much, how much do you want to make this for? And they're going to, it honestly, no bullshit. Um, it's going to be about 75 or $80,000 a year. That's what it's going to be. Um, so, and the reason I say that is because the, we have a, we have a comparable, the medication Epidiolex, it's just CBD and cherry flavoring. That's it. And it comes in a couple thousand milligrams and they charge insurance companies $75,000 a year for that because that's Holy what other seizure shit. medications go for. And they have to make back the millions they spent on the research for this millions over like 15 years. It took them to make that shit. So, yeah, you got to charge people $75,000 a year because they know we're going to sell this to X amount of people. You know, they, they have the formula. So mm -hmm. if they're going to do that mm -hmm. and they're going to make their money back and they go to insurance companies saying, okay, we want to charge fifty or $70,000 a year for this, insurance companies are going to go, people are going to just get this for like 20 bucks on the street, you know. They're going to grow it. They're going to grow gonna, it. You know, and they, they just think to themselves – are we going to get undercut if we start trying to do this by basically anybody and everybody in the States or in the black market? Because it's very successful. And what happened in California and Colorado with the high tax rate um, chased dispensaries out, especially since they're a cash business because, you know, it makes it tough. Um, because everyone else said, all right, do I want to spend 40 bucks on a joint? at this dispensary or can I just get it from my dealer way, way cheaper? And it's similar or better quality. You know, it's not like these guys are growing it, you know, in shitty areas now. Like it's a full operation in the black market. It's hydroponics. It's, you know, lab grown. They have proper scientists doing it. So the nascent, it's not like a, it's not like a nascent industry and they're going to treat it like that as an insurance company. So I don't know, man, without getting too much into the business, I just think it's quite possible that, um, no, company is going to jump on that because they they don't have a guaranteed return if pfizer is going to drop millions of bucks on something they're probably going to drop it on something that has a really 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 big market um they're already like a fortune 100 or probably even a fortune 50 company fortune 25 company they ain't gonna like say oh man let's try to go after this one little niche market over here for pain and maybe take some business away from like fentanyl makers or I don't know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Hey friends, I want to take a quick moment to ask you to support the show by leaving a rating and a review on your favorite platform. Your support means the world to us and it helps spread the message to even more people. We've gotten thousands and thousands of listeners and those high ratings help our show become more discoverable, allowing us to reach even more listeners and make an even greater impact. So if you've enjoyed what you heard so far, please take a moment to leave a rating and a review. It only takes a few seconds and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. And now let's get back to the show. 
Yeah, and also if I'm selling something like a fentanyl, if if I'm Pfizer and I'm selling something that has those addictive qualities, this is maybe my my conspiracy theory side, but like I A it's already there, it's already being marketed, it's already bringing in revenue. Why would I want to do something that I have to start from the ground up and that is not going to have the addictive qualities that's going to keep those customers coming back that I'm kind of mixing both, you know, my, my tinfoil hat, but also my business hat, but it makes 100% sense that no company is going to want to start from scratch if they can just improve whatever product lines they yes. have. That's what's a return, a tiny market, yeah, they, a they, tiny, they tiny the market. dilemma. So they, you know, you're, you're going up market. They're going to mm-hmm. keep going to bigger and bigger and bigger stuff. They're going to totally overlook anything that's smaller, which is why Rescue One CBD even exists because Charlotte's Web has the bigger market. They're trying to go like crazy with it. And I'm just aiming at firefighters. They don't want to look at firefighters. It's down market. They, they, there's only 1 million firefighters mm-hmm. about in the country. 1.2. 1.2. No big deal. And then, um, you know, you got shit, 60 or 70% of them more now is, are volunteer. Um, how many of them are really trying to buy it? So like, it's just ignored. And I wonder if that's the case. Now, the bigger question here is, is that good or bad for the fire service? If an insurance company and pharma ignores it, is that good or bad for us? If, if what we're trying to do is get U.S. firefighters to be able to use marijuana prescription or otherwise, um, then would, would it, would it speed up if, if pharmaceutical company accepts it or ignores it? If they accept it, it'll take years because of the three phases of research and FDA approval and blah, blah, blah. If they ignore it, um, that could create other opportunities. It could allow, um, right now you don't need legalization to be able to use it federally. There are departments that allow it. So the question I would have is, um, would it, would it, create the optics from other departments that would basically allow them to say, hey, let's revisit this thing. It's not in the same category as heroin. Maybe City Hall isn't as skeptical. Um, little shit like that. So one misconception I have to address is the Drug-Free Workplace Act. This is something that every department... Do you want to talk about that now? Is that good? Okay. Yeah, let's All go. Right. That was so going to be my next question. The, the DWFA, the, drug, the Drug-Free DFWA, Drug-Free Workplace Act, um, says like, all right, if you test positive, you can't get a grant, you know, or if you allow illegal drugs on duty, you can't get a grant. Everybody thinks that that says you can't allow drugs at all, which is funny, but it's the same thing with alcohol. It's the drug free workplace act also underlines alcohol. It doesn't say you can't use alcohol at home. It says you can't be drunk at work. And because of that, they can't tell you what you can and can't do at home. They just say you can't do it in the workplace. It's the Drug-Free Workplace Act, not the Drug-Free Home Place Act. So it is a misconception, and this isn't my opinion. Um, the article is from Lexipol. You guys should Google it. It's a really interesting read. But it's a former fire chief who became a lawyer and a lawyer who specializes in cannabis that wrote this article. And they basically tear that argument apart. And they'll say... You can't withhold federal funding over this, and it's even arguable whether the DOT um, can um, can can you know you get into an accident and workers comp says okay well you have to do a, a drug screening or whatever that whole DOT rule it's arguable whether that can uphold um, because of you know being able to use THC at home and the DOT recently as of last year changed their drug testing so. They went to an oral swab to test for cannabinoids instead of your analysis because of the inconsistency, because you can't tell when you took it. There's no proof that you're you're actually intoxicated at that moment. All that's to say um, that it's murky, but if moving from schedule one to schedule three doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to use marijuana right now, it might mean that your chief or your mayor or policy writers can say, this isn't you know, the, the federal illegality is, is still kind of murky, but it looks like we're moving in this direction. 
can we can we revisit this you know maybe six months ago you would have told them hey the um the D the dfwa says we can't uh have marijuana that's a misconception that would be like get out of my office i don't want to hear it now you could say it's actually a misconception they go okay maybe maybe we need to look more into this so in that res- yeah we could make some headway but on a federal level um i don't know So what I'm hearing is that while this looks amazing on paper, it is not that knight in shining armor that we expected to come in and save us. We still have a lot of work to do in the trenches in speaking with our elected officials in dealing with our unions and talking to management and the fire chief, continuing the trend of explaining the benefits and explaining how all of these different pieces can fit together with our current general orders and our rules and I think laws so. yeah. and everything, I think right? So. My opinion. Because I think we we thought, you know, again, everybody was pumped. Like, holy shit, we've been waiting for that rescheduling for so long. And, you know, it's like, yay, we cheer. We, you know, we're holding the joint and liners like, does anybody actually know what this means right. or like, are we still doing illegal <laughs> yeah. shit? Uh, the DEA said it's not as bad as heroin. That's basically all that happened. And yeah, and it's, Thank again, God. it's a good thing. But what it does do is it opens up the door for research. Um, it opens up the door for farms to, you know, be able to um, have insurance on their crops to have, they couldn't deduct anything. If they bought a tractor to harvest marijuana, they couldn't deduct it on their taxes. It's just simple shit like that. So those two things could have second and third order effects for years to come that would have like a really, really positive impact, but it just ain't going to do anything right now. Even honestly, man, even if they put it to schedule, uh, schedule five, right? Put it, put it in the same thing as Tylenol. That means it's over the counter, but that's what I always ask. Over the counter, what? Over the counter medicine. Yeah. It's drugs. It's a medication. And that means that pharma has to get in and do its thing. There's a difference between deschedule and reschedule. Reschedule is removing it down the schedule list. Deschedule means it's not considered a drug at all. You take it off and it's considered the same thing as a supplement that's like magnesium. Right. These these statements have not been approved by the FDA know, because you don't have to because it's descheduled. Because they're like, hold on a second. Uh, and I think we could agree on this. Like, While I would love to just have it really accessible right now, this is the complicated part. So you take it off the scheduling completely. DEA doesn't regulate shit on it at all. It's basically regulated by the FDA, quote unquote regulated, where they can slap you with a fine if you make any, um, you know, um, if you make any claims of what it can do medically. But it's sold next to oregano oil and, you know, um, like magnesium and CVS and uh, or valerian root, you know, like all those things. But none of those things get you high. So you have this this thing that will create an intoxicative effect um, and it's not regulated by anybody anywhere. So that's why they landed at three. They weren't comfortable with it going down to one because if it went down to one, then I think insurance companies would be like, we don't have to cover this. I'm sorry, five. five. Yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, correct on that. That's it. Didn't schedule one is the worst one. Schedule five is the easiest one. So if they dropped it all the way down, you know, and it's the same thing as a Tylenol, then I think you would have it really easily accessible. But what's the difference? Tylenol is just in a different aisle, but it's still purchased without a prescription. So, yeah, this is why a lot of people don't really know what's going on with it because it is the the ball is in like multiple courts. It could, pharma could say, hey, we're going to use this for something that there are no drugs for, you know, like an unknown unknown, black swan. They're going to be like, you know, I'll put this in fireman terms. Uh, Viagra wasn't originally a, a dick pill medication. It was actually an antihypertensive. And they just found this really interesting side effect. You know, they had to reschedule, not reschedule, they had to reapply for a different indication. They'd say, Hey, uh, aside from bringing your blood pressure down, all these guys are getting erections. Let's go and try to get uh, it indicated for that. So they had no idea that that was going to, 
it, it was what it was going to be used for. Maybe, you know, marijuana helps with um, some some organ or some function or something that that's extremely beneficial. And, um, you know, it could take away business from the cholesterol industry. You know, it could take away business from like the diabetes industry. They'd jump all over it. Um, I think, I don't think we're there yet. But yeah, we're not there yet. Years and years of research. Damn. I'm going to have to go flush my weed down the toilet, bro. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Uh, you have a note here that says, doesn't allow drug testing to be considered discrimination. Super interesting. Um, there, I, I, I want to bring up FDNY. Um, in New York, there have been a couple of cases. The most prominent one was probably in the city of Buffalo, uh, this, this captain got fired for failing a drug test, even though he had a prescription for marijuana, medical marijuana card. Um, he got fired. He went to court. It took him a couple of years. He won everything, got back pay, got his rank reinstilled, and Buffalo was forced to change their policy. Because in the, city, in the state of New York, you're allowed to use marijuana recreationally. So when the department said... I know any citizen in New York is allowed to use marijuana, but we're going to restrict this one group of people based on X, you know, their profession, that they can't do it. That's textbook discrimination. And it immediately um, upended a lot of other things and set into motion uh, the attorney general basically ordering the fire chief for the city of New York to stop testing for marijuana uh, immediate, effective immediately. And it was a friend. Yeah, I know guys that work for FDNY and I was texting them the night it happened. Sorry, the morning after it happened because they, they got an email the night before saying, you're going to see a memo come out tomorrow morning. Uh, we have no idea what's going on. We don't know what's going to happen with discipline if somebody shows up high, but just effective immediately. We're not testing for, for marijuana anymore. And it threw everything everybody into a frenzy. They're like, can chauffeurs do it? Am I allowed to be high, like, you know, the night before work? Um, what are we testing for if we're not testing? You know, it was like all this shit. We don't know. So other states started doing this. Uh, New Jersey started doing this. They started allowing cops in New Jersey to use marijuana um, based on this discrimination clause. And apparently, like, the cops, the police chiefs in, in New Jersey lost their shit. And they, they, they appealed to the attorney general. For the state and they said this is unacceptable you can't allow people who hold guns to be uh to, to use thc and the attorney general i'm paraphrasing but just said oh and they mentioned their collective bargaining agreement they said union contract says they, they can't do it and in in a very nice way he said i don't care you know he just said this this is state law and the attorney general um and it's been appealed at the supreme court and lost like this is precedent that's already been set you can't do anything about it. So I don't care what your union contract says. This is done. Um, because if we abstract it out, at the core, yeah. it's discrimination. It is taking a subset of the population, restricting their ability to do X based on a trait yeah. Y. And fill in the blanks. Use your variables, whatever. You can't do... THC because you're a cop, you can't do THC because like you are taking these populations and saying, can't do it. And that is. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting. So I, I spoke, um, with an attorney about this, uh, which, you know, if anybody's listening to this and they're thinking about policy in their state, or they're trying to go down that route, talk to a lawyer, not, not us, but you know, the, the interesting Fact. thing was when I spoke to a lawyer in Florida about this, they're like, that wouldn't work in Florida. The precedent, I Why guess, not? is different here, and the way our law is written, um, it, it's it's weird. So, Florida a first responder doesn't have that protection, and in for whatever reason, in the law in the state of New York and New Jersey, they do now because of that. Florida is there's a bill as of last October. It's been on the floor for almost a year that specifically protects first responders. The same thing Virginia just did. Virginia just passed that law that said first responders are protected and they're allowed to use marijuana despite of what their employer has for a rule. They, I don't know if it's copied and pasted exactly. I haven't read the entire Virginia bill, but I read uh, the, the, the description of it 
and I did open the bill up and the Florida one's pretty damn similar. So, um, the idea would be if, if a state starts to allow marijuana, whether it's federally legal or not, you could have, um, an employer say, I don't care what you say, this is a condition of employment. So fight me, <laughs> you know, come at me. What are you going to do about it? This outlines at the state level saying you can't do that. If it's illegal for that, for that reason, discrimination. So, um, ultimately, I mean, it, it comes down state, state to state as of now. And I would even be curious after it becomes federally legal, if you'll still see those fights break out in places like, um, Iowa, um, somebody mentioned Indiana, you know, um, allowing first responders to use it or not trying to fight it because you're going to have, you're going to have elected officials at the top of each state going, okay, I didn't want marijuana in the first place, but now it's legal. Um, so we're going to make sure that our first responders can't use it so that, you know, they're not showing up to work intoxicated, um, which is a very superficial way to look at it. Cause we could be doing that right now with every other medication that we're prescribed and alcohol. So that's kind of, kind of ironic. Hey everyone, it's TJ here from Keep the Promise. As you know, this podcast is all about helping firefighters become more resilient and well-rounded so that they can be a force for good within their fire department and their community. But today I want to talk to you about something that's just as important, and that is supporting firefighters who are going through tough times. When one of our fellow firefighters is off work because they have to go to the Center for Excellence, they have to go to rehab, they have mental health issues, or they have other health issues, it really takes away their support system and it wreaks havoc on their finances and their family's finances. And many times these brothers and sisters are left to struggle alone away from their support system and the people who love them without the resources they need to recover. That's why I'm setting a bold new goal. And that is to reach 150 total patrons on Patreon so that we can start a fund to help firefighters and their families during these challenging times. And I need your help to make it happen. With your support on Patreon, we'll be able to provide financial assistance to firefighter families who are battling things like addiction, depression, and cancer. We're going to help alleviate the financial strain that can come with being away from the fire department so that our brothers and sisters can focus on healing and recovering. Now, reaching 150 total patrons is a big goal, but I believe that we can do it together. And when we do, we'll be able to make a real difference in the lives of those who serve and protect alongside us. So, if you're not already a patron, I invite you to join us today. Head over to joinkeepthepromise.com and sign up today. Again, that is joinkeepthepromise.com. And if you already are a patron, thank you so much for your support. You'll be receiving some exclusive rewards and perks as a way of saying thanks. Together, let's show our fellow firefighters that we've got their back just like they always have ours. Thank you for listening. Let's get started with the episode.